My name is Marcus Crino, and uh, I've been in hemp, I want to say since 2015. In the last four growing seasons, I've been really looking at these different insects. Tree frog. And what I find really interesting about it is that these plants are bringing forward a bunch of different diversity. I mean, diversity in terms of pest management. So you got ladybugs here, and they're always mating inside these nail plants. I don't know why. Then something I've noticed was these Japanese beetles started showing up. I started like getting rid of them because they were just coming in droves. And then I wrote a grant to the state project, and I was able to secure a grant. So if anybody wants to know anything about how to secure a stair grant or need someone to like, you know, can you look over my application before I turn it in? Take make sure you take my information, okay? And what's interesting about the stair grant is I'm using a lot of different integrated pest management tools that are sustainable. So I'm not going and spraying my field. I'm using Japanese beetle tents to catch them. I'm using Dr. Bronner's unscented magic soap inside a uh, five gallon bucket and knocking all the Japanese beetles off. It takes about 40 minutes to an hour to cover one acre, so uh, by hand. And then some things I'm also doing is I'm, I'm adding this stuff called Beetle Be Gone, and I found it in Denver, Colorado. But basically you can either put it in the soil because the larva, that's where they start, and then you can also spray it on your plants. And what I'm, in, what I'm finding really interesting about this, about this research, the stair grant, is I, I started at the College of Army Nation, but then I, I transferred it over to another part of my reservation. What was interesting was that the infestation of the Japanese beetles were not as prevalent as they were at the college. And so this, this next year I have to figure out, okay, I'm gonna go back to the college and figure out why that is. And what's interesting too, this isn't a hemp plant at all. This is actually a, some native species plant that's sitting around. What I noticed is that a lot of the Japanese beetles are flocking to these native plants. So like mullein and like these other various different plants that are kind of growing, lamb's quarters. And um, it's just fascinating to figure that out. So in terms of my research and what we're understanding is that Japanese beetles potentially might not be hazardous to hemp plants, but they could also be attracting Japanese beetles. Because they're another, you know, you got the ladybugs mating in the, in the male plants, you got the Japanese beetles mating in the female plants, and you got the reproduction of all these different insects going on at the same time. So it's very fascinating. And what I'm really trying to hit home about is we're talking about the environment, all these plants and all these insects coming together. There's really not a lot of research on it. So all you young people in this room who want to understand how hemp is being grown and what you can do to deal with the IPM management of hemp, there's a, there's a gold mine there, all right? <clears throat> Some of the other things about hemp is this root system. Now, I got this root right here. <clears throat> this was over one growing season. And what I did was, <clears throat> I basically watered every other day from the time I planted up until the end of July. This is the root system that you can get from that. Look at that, just three months. Why? When you don't water them and you just let them grow freely. Dry farm. I mean, it doesn't look as, as sexy as it did before because I ran into a couple doors on the way here and you know, broke off. <laughs> we got caught a couple tourists, you know, cowboys. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of other things too about it being a uh, carbon sequester, there's a lot of information out there. Some stuff in Europe says 2.4 acres brings in about 22 tons of carbon. There's some stuff in America that's even less than that. So it's still, it's still to be determined how much it can really pull from the atmosphere, but we know it can pull from the atmosphere. Economics. <clears throat> so I was uh, granted a generous grant from the Native American Agriculture Fund to study hemp and develop a feasibility study for my tribe as well as the other regional tribes in the area. But I'm not just going to stop there because look at hemp feasibility study and a seven year observational analysis of the American hemp industry. 
This feasibility study is going to be available in 2023, and I would recommend if anybody wants a copy of it, you let me know and I'll give it to you because I'm going to put a lot of information in there that's going to be applicable to all across America. The College of Army Nation is my partner. It's been my partner since 2015 when we first grew hemp and got rated. The USDA NEFA, we got one of those big USDA hemp supply chain grants, and we're actually in the process of developing a hemp research center on the College of Army Nation, and that's gonna be open to all tribal students and non-native students who wanna come and learn about hemp. So if you wanna know more, you wanna develop genetics, because I have a lot of genetics, um, and I'll be teaching as well. Please enroll in the College of Army Nation and uh, devote your expertise, your brilliant mind to this because we're looking at seven years of catching up on hemp research, all right? <clears throat> and we talk about CBD in the market and all that stuff, and everyone's like, well, we can't really find a place to sell it. Well, the USDA bio certified bio based product system that's through the USDA allows you to have a federal procurement opportunity to where if you're able to develop a value-added product and sell it through this program, you have a niche. You gotta compete with a lot of other people, I'm gonna be honest. But, when we look at it, you can make perfume. You can sell your CBD if you want. You could develop um, various different automotive products. You could create a biodegradable plastic product. You could create something that a national park needs. Maybe you need to do something with oil mitigation. You know, maybe you need something to do with uh, finding plastic uh, trash bags that, you know, aren't plastic, but they're made out of hemp. I'm telling you, you guys gotta look at the USDA Bio Certified Bio Preferred Program. And if you guys don't know how to start something like that, there is a woman in Gledwood Springs, Colorado, brilliant. Her name's Barbara Philippone. You need to go see her. She has 30 years of experience. Glenwood Springs, Colorado, Barbara Philippone, environmental textiles. She's had a hemp-based company that has been successful for the last 20 years. She just got her, her certification for 20 years being a part of the Bio Preferred Program. So any tribes that are looking for something that they can actually get a niche in the market, you gotta go through the Bio Preferred Program. That's my honest opinion after seven years of being in this industry. Climate change. I love climate change. <clears throat> so, you're asking yourself, what the hell is this? What is this field here? It's all hemp. This was planted on July or June 7th, 2020. End of the month. First week in July. July 23rd. You have plants growing up to 14 feet tall in a matter of less than 90 days. And this is a fiber variety. This is Anka and Altair. And what's really interesting about it is we didn't use any water. We did not use any water. We let it just drop with rainfall. And I want to say it was about 10 inches of rain that year. It's really all about the soil, gang. I'm really going to be honest with you. It's all about the soil. If you guys know a guy by the name of Will Allen, he ran Growing Power for years. He told me the same thing back in 2011. It's all about the soil, Mark. If you got good soil, you can grow anything. And he was right. I can't believe it. Because I didn't use any water. I just made this soil really nice. And look at this beautiful crop of hemp that came up. It was a jungle. You couldn't even find me in there. I'm gonna be honest with you. It's amazing. But this is something I'm talking about in the sense of, you don't need any water for it. We're coming into an area, I know some of you out there who are from the West, you guys need to run out of water. What are you gonna do when you don't have anything? No water to grow. Hemp. Why? Because the hemp seed has everything you need for the human body. High omega-3s, omega-6s, it has all of your essential amino acids, and one tablespoon packs 10 grams of protein so when we're talking about trying to figure out what we need to do about food, man, get some hemp seeds, throw a little chocolate on me if you don't like the taste of it. Got it made, all right? Said something I said earlier about a carbon sequestration? Totally. When you talk about this plant growing back year after year, it does. Does it, does it uh, get destroyed by winter? No, it winterizes over winter too. 
So the beauty of it is that this crop that I grew in 2021, I didn't touch the field at all. It came back in 2021. So it's really interesting in the sense of you have a crop that just keeps on giving. And not only that, these sprouts here are amazing. So when it comes to using as a garnishment on a piece of meat or with some mashed potatoes, that's where it's at. Can't tell you enough. It tastes like basil and hemp. If they were to come together and make a baby, that's what, it's, that's what it tastes like. <laughs> Not that I know what babies taste like. <clears throat> so, tribal sovereignty. I really thought about this for a long time because I'm like, what am I going to talk about with tribal sovereignty that is related to hemp? Well, Hempstead Project Heart played a big role in making sure that tribal sovereignty was upheld and affirmed in the 2018 Farm Bill. We wanted to make sure everybody in Indian country had the right to grow, and we did not have to worry about DEA raids or FBI coming in without warrants, because that's what they did to us in Monopoly in 2015. <clears throat> now, how do we look at to the future? Because this is obviously in the past. I'm currently developing genetics. I took three land races from Ukraine, Romania, Southeast Asia, and I developed this variety here. It's called Coyote Otter 15, in remembrance of mine and John's meeting, since my name is Kiski Soma Kate, so daughter, and John was Coyote. So it's Coyote Otter 15. And why is it tribal sovereignty? Because I don't gotta pay anybody, ain't no money to grow this crop. And that's what you guys all gotta think about, because this commercial varieties, this whole you know, you need certified seed to grow hemp. No, they just want to create a monopoly. That's what it comes down to. And when you come down to it, if it really comes to it, you all come see me, or you go see Winona Le Duke. Winona Le Duke bought the collection that I pulled from. So, Winona Le Duke or myself have seed that is available for Indian country, and you go and you come talk to us, and we'll give you the seed. That's tropical sovereignty. Historical perspectives. Another one I was thinking about, what I'm gonna talk about. <clears throat> in 2018, right before we, we uh, were victorious with the Farm Bill, we were looking at trying to figure out what's the connection of tribes and hemp. Because in my culture, there is this word called sanap, which means hemp. But then when you go talk to the elders, like, no, 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 that's dog man. Well, I'm a stubborn monogamy man, and I'm not gonna stand for that, even if it is my elder. So I'm gonna go look, and I'm gonna dig, and I'm gonna dig, and I'm gonna dig, and figure out if that's really true. And sure enough, I go to the Library of Congress, I find this book, Anthropological Papers of the American, American Museum of Natural History, textile fibers used in Eastern Aboriginal North America. Look at this, you got these, all these different definitions. Now, Indian hemp, dog man. Cannabis, sativa, hemp. You know what's interesting about it? You start looking through it, it's just a directory of all these artifacts that are all throughout America. I found this bag in the Milwaukee Public Museum. It's got a Thunderbird on the back, on the front. It's got a water panther, water panther on the back. Made out of hemp. They have prisoner ties from the sack and fox they're in the Milwaukee Public Museum. When I went to New York City to look at the Aboriginal bow string from the Algonquin tribes at the National uh, at the American Museum of Natural History, it was lost. They didn't have it. But there's documentation that they did have it. So, you know, my whole conspiracy thing was like, oh, maybe they just came in, took it, because they didn't want Mark to find out that, you know, hemp has been growing in America for a long time. I'm not saying it originated here. Let's just put that out there because there's a lot of haters out there in the world that don't like it. And they'll say, oh, Mark Greeno thinks that we grew hemp all this whole time. No, 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 no. I'm just curious if it came through the trade routes or if it came over with the colonists. That's all I want to know because regardless, our people were using hemp. <clears throat> this is something I really wanted to hit home with you guys. If you guys haven't had a chance and you got some money to spend, you need to go to the National Agricultural Library in Beltsville, Maryland. 
and you want to go to the Special Collections Division, and you want to ask for the Leicester Dewey files, because you have diagrams of how to develop a decorticator. So you need to spend a million dollars on it. No, 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 no. You go and you figure it out. And you see what this is? Because I know there are a lot of good engineers in Indian country, whether they are educated or uneducated. And I want to make sure that you all go inspire after today, and you go tell them, we need help with developing our decorticators. People are taking pictures, great. If you need more information, just let me know, okay? But you can see it. These are just little, little dots. They're just spinning inside. And then when you bring that hemp through, it breaks down. I brought a hemp break today because I wanted to show you guys just how really simple it is to do it. Because it's really about seeing it more than anything. Once you see it, then you can figure out, oh, okay, I could probably develop a machine that can just do this without getting people to do it. Because guess what? It takes six hours to process 15 pounds of hemp with this thing. Trust me, I did it. But, like I said, so much information. And there's more information in Washington, D.C. If you go to the National Archives, there's more information about this stuff. It's just out there. But for the record, they are classifying some of the stuff because I've had some documents classified on me. So go out there, quick. Ooh. Well, this is my contact information, mark at hempsteadprojectheart.org. This is my phone number, my direct line, if you guys need to get a hold of me. Um, and that's, that's my presentation, you guys. Um, I just want to say Macho Wannon for being here, for being present. It's really nice to see this room packed. Um, and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to start processing this hemp. You guys want to come up, you guys want to process it with me, great. You guys, I'm going to take questions while I'm doing that, because I know we got a limited time in this room. But I'm not taking these hemp stocks home, so anybody that wants to help me process these hemp stocks, please do, because that 30 hour drive with the hemp stocks hitting me in the face from time to time again, I'm not gonna do it again. So, with that, that's it. So when you guys want to process this stuff, sometimes you can do it in a bundle. It's really easy. You start going. called X59. It was developed in Canada, I want to say. And um, doesn't really have a lot of great fiber within it. You know, it's just kind of really broken up because what happens is, is that when you start growing hemp for seed, the plant starts hollowing out. And so you lose a lot of fiber. So if you really want to grow fiber, we go back to my, my talk earlier about when that hemp fiber was ready by like July 23rd, you're gonna to wanna to basically cut it all down and start redding it in the field one to two weeks after that. Um, this one here is a Chinese variety. It's either Yuma or Jin Mao. It's a beast. We go back to climate change again. These plants can handle a tornado storm. What's gonna happen is they're basically gonna be standing and then once that tornado rips through, they're gonna lay down, but they're gonna grow back up again, but they're gonna be curved. But then their root system right here, it expands and strengthens so that it can withstand those storms. Another reason why you should grow hemp, because when we deal with these crazy storms that are gonna be coming through because of climate change, um, it's gonna be a good crop, resilient.
<laughs> Anybody want to try? Give it a shot? Come on up. Anybody want to check it out? Come on up. Mark, what did you say about X59? X59, uh, it's a grain crop, usually grows about four to five feet tall. Um, and what happens is that it hollows out. So once you start growing, basically, you're gonna wanna put it right back here and just start laying it down and cracking it. All right, go ahead and hold it. X59 grows about four to five feet tall. It has a really nice cola, so it gets to all that seed. But what happens is that you, you don't want to use it for a fiber material once it goes to seed, but it is a, it's, a, it's a grain crop regardless, but basically it hollows out so you don't get as much material once you run it through the process. What about the Jinma? Have you heard, um, I've heard that some of it's going hot. So the big thing about the Chinese varieties, if anybody grows Chinese varieties in America, you don't, you do not want to test it before it gets sexed. Once it goes sexed, it drops. Okay. So if it comes up as a hot crop, wait a couple of weeks until it sexes and starts forming the seed, and then it'll decrease. That's a big thing you need to understand. That's awesome. yeah, thank you. So I brought this green stock for a reason. One, it's a part of my genetics that I developed, but two, it's a hard it's a process. Watch this. Oh. See, this green material, you don't want this for processing because what you're going to do is you're going to really mess up a machine if you're going to be pushing it through. So, what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to lay it in the field and you're going to want it to rep. And what it's called is redding is a whole process of, you're basically breaking it down. You're letting the environment, mother nature, take care of it for you. And what's gonna happen is all those leaves and everything's gonna disintegrate, and all that nitrogen and everything else that was being taken by the hemp plant is gonna go back in the soil. So it puts the soil in a better status of being good in terms of good quality soil when you leave the stuff out in the field. And sometimes you gotta flip it and let it, Degrade because you're, you're basically degrading fiber materials in the outside, and you want to make sure that when you do that, that it does not get too moldy because it's a pain to deal with when it gets moldy. You might as well just burn it. And another thing, biochar anybody that's in this room that deals with fertilizer and does not have fertilizer available, you grow hemp, you burn this stuff, you put it in your field, I guarantee you you're not going to have any weeds because I grew some varieties this past year and I used biochar. It's, it's a TEK thing, you know? Like, let's get down to it. Biochar is just like this new thing. No, 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 we, 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 we made that. We created that stuff. And what comes down to it is that the biochar has so much great material and you mix it with that soil, perfect for just fertilizer, a natural fertilizer. Um, I, I wouldn't, I would, she, she mentioned pond running. I would not recommend pond running because what are you gonna do with the water after it's done? And you're gonna create another whole environmental hazard because all that stuff, all the enzymes, everything is breaking down within that water, it's no plan. What are you gonna do with it? Are you gonna just dump it out somewhere else? Well, it's gonna go into the soil. You have to think about that when you're dealing with this stuff. I also process a lot of hemp using a hammer mill, and this is what I got from it. Material is not separated out at all. It's broken down significantly, so you have to figure out a way to separate this stuff. You could not separate it and use that for like a non-woven textile or like a, a composite, a bio-composite, and start kind of mixing it together. What's really interesting is that Europe, you have BMW, Volkswagen, Audi, they create all their door panels on the hemp. What they don't use on the assembly line, they basically sell it wholesale and they get shipped to Canada and they make these amazing briefcases. Real sturdy. So that's another thing you can think about. But that's the thing. I really want you guys to understand that when it comes to hemp, there is no blueprint on it. We make it up. We use our creativity, our thinking. That's something John Trudell, 
talked about before he died. He said, you want to be a thinker because the thinkers create the solutions in the world. Be a thinker. That is the biggest thing that I'm going to ask you guys to walk away with is to be a thinker. Use your mind clearly, coherently, so that you can come up with a really good idea to create something with this hand. Because tribal people, we've always, have, we've always been the most creative. We've always been the most innovative. This is what we can do to, for the world, is create a hemp economy. Because no one wants to do it. Because everybody wants the money. We gotta do it from the heart. And we have to do it for the planet, and we have to do it for the next seven generations. So that's, that's all I gotta say.